For many, 1947 was a pivotal point in history. But what if the real pivot point was 780,000 years before that? Why is the Australite tektite at the center of a mystery? There is an asteroid bombardment. There is no crater. A large craft had been destroyed in space. Such conclusive evidence. NASA scientists went to great troubles to see if they could replicate this. Homo sapiens are genetically engineered, diverged 780,000 years ago. How do we come about? What is a human? You know, what is our origin? Why are we here? Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality. On this episode, we hear from Bruce Fenton, who along with his research partner and wife, Danny, are radically rewriting the human origin story. My name's Bruce Fenton. I'm an independent researcher of an anomalous phenomena, ancient mysteries, a fairly wide range of topics. There are times when there's, you know, there's, there's no way around it that you sort of need to visit a location. In my case, that's meant traveling to Egypt. We've also in Ecuador, you know, I visited a site out in the jungle. It's only known through a few people that have been out boots on the ground and visited the site, you know, that's been important to my research too. And really, I've been to sites across most of the world, I think six of the seven continents at this point. It's a whole rewrite of a, of a very widely accepted consensus view on the human origin story and on the early migrations of the, of the certainly the first modern humans, and, and even before that, going to archaic hominids. The work we're doing tackles all of that. We're not dealing with a separate set of evidence. The foundational material that I'm looking at is the same archaeological finds and genetic studies as any of the mainstream academics are using in their work. One of the, the best examples of a, a fixed narrative that is widely accepted throughout not only um, like paleoanthropology, archaeology, anthropology, but, but science in general is this the recent out of Africa theory, which has become very dogmatic. The out of Africa theory, based on 1980s advances in genetic sciences, concluded modern humans evolved in and then migrated out of Africa. This was popularized by documentaries like this one, featuring Hollywood actor Danny Glover. 80,000 years ago, a tiny group of modern humans braved the terrors of the Red Sea and left Africa forever. They carried with them the future of the world. By 10,000 years ago, they have penetrated every corner of the globe. Now, this, this is a good example of where the evidence has shifted, but the narrative hasn't, because we now have, of course, genetic studies that are coming into play, you know, an entire huge field now of genomic sciences that really didn't exist when the, when the model first emerged. Pick any article on the topic of the migrations or expansions of the first Eurasian people. And you'll find it will start off with, uh, we know that around about 50,000 or 60,000 or 70,000 years ago, a group of Africans come out of, you know, usually out of East Africa, migrate into Eurasia and go on to populate the continent. Finally, they reach Australia and America and so on. There's obviously an issue here because there's too many dates for the same event. I think that what we have here, in fact, is very strong evidence for two distinct events. A movement of people going into Africa 70,000 years ago, which is validated both by genetic information. We have the appearance of new haplogroups. We have 
the L3 haplogroup, which is mitochondrial. We also have CT, which is a Y chromosomal haplogroup, which both appear around 70,000 years ago in the genome of modern Africans. Now, this is studies not taken from ancient DNA. This is taken from modern DNA, right? Now, what is happening in the world 70,000 years ago? Well, 73,000 years ago, the Lake Toba supervolcano has erupted and is in the process of devastating the entire northern hemisphere of our planet. So, what is that going to lead to? It's going to lead to forced migrations. And if you're lucky enough to be somewhere in Western Eurasia, particularly the Middle East, you have the opportunity to cross into Africa and into safe zones in sub-equatorial Africa via the Bab el Mandab Straits. And this is precisely where we see the emergence of these haplogroups, right there where we would expect these climate migrants to appear. What else do we find? We find the first appearance of arrowheads and ranged weapons. An incredible leap forward in technology, which happens to appear 70,000 years ago in East Africa, exactly where we have these new haplogroups. Indeed, we also have the first complex mobile art, These um, some of these uh, carved stone pieces that have become famous in the Blombos Caves region and elsewhere. There's very obviously a cultural shift underway which fits diffusion rather than sudden emergence. And this is precisely what the genetic data is telling us. That A new paper has just come out, in fact, about a week ago, and they have found that the Y chromosomal lineages of all Eurasian people points to a migration out of Southeast Asia and East Asia 55,000 years ago. Where's Africa in that story, right? This is, this is hugely problematic. A 2018 paper looking at um, the, the mtDNA, the mitochondrial lineages, they found that the oldest variants of haplogroups M and N, which are considered foundational to all modern Eurasian people. Those turn out to be in Aboriginal Australians, right? Nowhere near the Middle East, nowhere near where they think that this, these new haplogroups are appearing, you know, in East Africa and the Middle East. So you've now got the female and male lineages seeming to arise somewhere in, in Oceania or East Asia, right? Now, <laughs> this runs absolutely counter to the idea that we have a migration coming out of East Africa. So why is it that this doesn't you know, radically change the story? It's not being allowed to filter through to the public. It's certainly being, in some respects, suppressed. They having had an article on this subject published in Forbes magazine online, and within hours, uh, senior editors spiking the story and having it removed with no explanation because it, it questioned a fundamental uh, dogma in science and it was just seen as unacceptable. We look at the Aboriginal Australians, their worldview. We find that, you know, they're dealing with extended consciousness as being, you know, a matter of fact that, you know, that we are more than simply our body and that our history is more than, you know, a pile of stone tools. I've had my own very strange experiences that, that in some cases have provided information which has prompted me to look into areas of both human history and cognitive abilities that are not well understood. You know, and th this has come about through a series of very strange things that have happened to me. Shamanic experience, you know, a, a journey in an altered state of consciousness. I didn't have a context for this, but this, in some respects, I would say, began a path for me personally. I connected with a, a, a very well-respected expert in that field, Dr. Michael Carmichael, who's considered one of the, I suppose, one of the the leading thinkers really in in sh shamanic states and altered states of consciousness. And you know, he, he was sort of kind enough to take me under his wing a bit and share a lot of information with me about this field. Uh, and really, I, I think, started me down that path of, of looking at you know, what does this mean for us as, as human beings, that we can have these experiences and that, you know, perhaps we can access information about not only ourselves, but history, you know, perhaps, lost elements of our story, that these exist in some intangible field or you know other place that we can access. I was taken to a site called uh, Abu Ghurab, which is again, it's a, usually off limits to tourists. Now, at this very ancient site, which is rumored to be one of the oldest sites in the, in the Giza, you know, uh, greater collection of ancient sites, 
I had a very strange experience looking out across the site and suddenly feeling sort of compelled to look up at this star cluster known as the Pleiades, which in itself is not a particularly glaring set of stars. They're quite faint, but I just felt really compelled to look up at them as they were rising above this temple site and had this bizarre sense of being in communion with some intelligence linked with this star cluster. But it also turned out that a, a good friend of mine, Richard Gabriel, who's a, a researcher that tackles anomalous sites in Egypt, he just happened to be going out to Cairo uh, during the same period that I was also you know, traveling out there. And we, we hadn't planned this at all together. And when we sort of realized this, you know, we arranged that I, I could meet up with him. And because he has a really a great knowledge of the Giza Plateau, the, the important sites, I was only able to go to the temple site at Abu Ghurab because of Richard's knowledge. Now, if I had gone at any other time, I probably would have not even known this place existed. Right, so I had initially this synchronicity that, you know, there's the right person just happens to be there that is able to take me to the right place, you know, and it's just as I've reconnected with the person who will go on to be not only my wife, but very important to my research journey and this story that we are obviously sharing. Now, this has all come about quite spontaneously. And on top of that, then I find myself, you know, without any obvious motivation, you know, push to have a kind of psychical communion with some other intelligence that I, I can't tangibly see or even detect, you know, in this flow of strangeness. This then leads on to later events. Now, if we skip forward about two months, I find myself now, I've, I've gone on from Egypt to England to Spain and from Spain to Ecuador with, with Daniela to a family home that have extended family has out there. It turns out that there is this person who has just come back from an expedition into the jungle. Now out of all the people in Ecuador who would end up in a room with someone just back from a, a very strange mysterious ancient site in the jungle, there's me, you know, a guy who spent decades researching ancient mysteries and is probably the only English speaking researcher in that field for like hundreds of if not thousands of miles around. You know, and, it's, and this guy's just come back and he's telling us we found these giant hammers and we found these, these strange, huge megalithic blocks. And I'm sitting there thinking, what are the chances that within a couple of weeks of arriving in Ecuador from Egypt, you know, and these other megalithic sites that are anomalous, you know, that here I am being told about yet another set of, you know, fantastical constructions of the ancient world that are just not fitting into the conventional story at all with these giant tools. The flow just seems to continue and, if anything, accelerate a connection to a people known as the Lagoa Santa. It turns out that the Lagoa Santa uh, are in this area. They're up in parts of Ecuador, including Banos de Agua Santa, which is the nearest town to this lost megalithic site in the Yanganatis. Now, who are the Lagoa Santa? That's a really important area here because these are a, a strange population of early Americans, the first Americans really, down in Brazil at, at a site called Lagoa Santa and areas nearby who seem to have entered the continent around 50,000 years ago based on some of the, the rock shelters, the artwork, some of the uh, carbon dating that's been done down in Brazil. What is particularly strange is that they have what's called the Australoid skull type, or basically they seem to be Australian Aboriginals in their morphology. Uh, this is very unlike the finds of Clovis remains, who are seen you know, as an Asiatic population that enters the Americas from the north around about 15,000 years ago. Now, anyone familiar with the, the current consensus dogma, really, on the first hu modern humans in the Americas will know that Clovis I has taken a long time to die. The idea that 13,000 years ago, the first modern humans arrived across Beringia and into the, the northern areas of North America, and that they moved slowly down into the greater part of the continent. And that this is a narrative that's only recently been dethroned. Despite the fact evidence existed for a very long time that squarely 
suggested that modern humans were in the Americas much earlier. For example, we have the, these the Bluefish Caves, where there was dates going back 20,000 years up in the far north. Now, that in itself should have been a rewrite of, of the narrative. But when you go down to the south and put down into Brazil and you have these Lagoa Santa where archaeologists are doing really solid work, you know, they're finding dates that push back 20, 30, 40,000, even 50,000 years ago based on a wide range of evidence types. Um, you know, you have cave sites, we have art, we have fires, you know, cooking fires, we have bones, you know, we have a wide range of archaeology down in Brazil that have been studied not only by the local Brazilian academics, but teams from France, from the, when the major museums in France have been out there, they've dated a site at over 20,000 years. This is solid academic work that's being done, and yet it's also considered hugely controversial because it pushes the narrative so far back that we're not just going a bit beyond Clovis at you know 13 to 15,000 years, we're going uncomfortably back, you know, tens of thousands of years earlier, suggesting that modern humans have been in the Americas from around the same time as the Eurasian expansion 55,000 years ago. This is a, a, a huge hot potato which a lot of the academics don't want to touch, particularly North American and European academics who have been pushing back against this and essentially ignoring the studies down in Brazil. Obviously the Lagoa Santa being Aboriginal Australian type people takes us back to Australia and the idea that there is a, a story in that region which is not being told. Now it's not just one which modifies the out of Africa narrative, but I would say it goes much deeper. Back in 2013 I had connected with some Australian researchers who had also been looking at this, you know, the idea that perhaps there was an out of Australia theory, you know, in the works because the Aboriginal people say this in their own law. They say, you know, we were the first, there were no others before us, all others have come out of here. Now that's absolutely enshrined in their law. These guys connected me into a lady there who, who had information suggested that not only did the modern humans arise there, their origins went all the way back to Australia in the very distant past, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and that there had been an otherworldly connection. As the Aboriginals suggest in their, their creation spirits, these beings that walked the land in the beginning, in the dream time, who helped create humans, that there was perhaps scientific evidence that would support this. This led to a, my book Ancient Aliens in Australia in 2013, and that really situated into a whole new area of research, the possibility that there was direct evidence for an alien intervention in human evolution hundreds of thousands of years ago. I was quite aware that there is an intelligence at work behind the scenes of my research and behind the scenes of humanity in general that is involved in the story of our evolution. Now, when I connected with the Australian researchers that collaborated on my book, Ancient Aliens in Australia, they also led me to another connection, which was a lady called Valerie Barrow, who had a book called Alcharinga, When the First Ancestors Were Created, in which it describes an ancient contact event, which is involved, well, involved in the human evolutionary story, that there's a contact that leads to changes in the early humans and a new species, Homo sapiens. Now, for most people, that would just seem like such an extraordinarily big leap. But if you take it in the context of that I'm having events in my personal life and with my wife, contact type experiences with an intelligence that is basically informing us that it's involved in the human story, that it's over time has modified certain populations that has done these things and now I'm finding this same story is coming to me through these Australian researchers we're working with and you know other people they know uh, who have a similar narrative so 
for me, it was like, aha, you know, the chain of synchronicity was flowing onward through the people we were making contact with. We're finding elements of validation for personal experiences we were going through. So we ended up having to really look seriously at the idea that there is a another player in this story that is not appearing in academic literature, is not in the National Geographic documentaries, because it's considered too strange, too anomalous, too socially unacceptable, and would require the modification, not only of this story, but of the way we think about humanity, our cultures, our religious structures, an absolute fundamental earthquake for the human species. Valerie came into contact with an, an artifact in a very peculiar way. She had a house that was called Al Chiringa, which is an Aboriginal term which actually refers to the first time, the dream time, was known as the Al Chiringa time. Now, this is another synchronicity because somebody heard about her house having this name. They were in possession of a, a sacred artifact of the Aboriginal people, and now this person took it as a kind of a sign that this was where the object could safely be kept temporarily. So she says, yes, fine, I will look after this, this object, which is, is, is wrapped up in paper bark. So she doesn't directly see it. She puts it in a, a shoebox, puts it away, respectfully doesn't take it out of its bindings, which is the right thing to do. You know, it's considered wrong to look on one of these objects. It's actually called a chiringa. Now, the Aboriginal people say you shouldn't, if you're not initiated, you shouldn't really, you know, openly hold and look at one. So she does the right thing with it. But what happens next is, is totally bizarre. She finds that there is a voice making contact with her in, in her head, in a direct, almost voice to skull type way, if we think of it in terms of technologies that we understand now, that, that there is a communication which is not auditory for everyone around her, but that she can hear it as a voice and that starts telling her that there is a consciousness of a star person connected with this artifact and that it's wanting to share a lost history of this planet. And it, it explains that it, it has influenced the consciousness of people to travel around Australia to come to her home. And that it says it's quite capable of going wherever it wants because it will simply modify the thinking of the people it's in contact with. So if anyone's, how does this object come to be there? It's through its own choosing, it appears. Now, the narrative it shares is of, it's just amazing. You know, the idea that there has been a, a visitation hundreds of thousands of years ago, and that these artifacts, some of these objects have been left in Australia, which we can assume are some kind of monitoring, recording, communication devices that are connected to this visitation. It explains to her that there's been a, a huge ship has arrived here, was been in orbit, was destroyed in an event, an attack, again, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Debris rained down across our planet. It, it then goes on to explain that there is a, a series of very crucial events here. There is an asteroid bombardment five years later that is engineered by an extraterrestrial race that they choose to bombard this planet. And shortly after this, the first ancestors of Homo sapiens are genetically engineered from a existing hominin species. Now of course there's a much bigger story here and credit to Valerie you know she details all of that in her book which people can read but my interest was in these major events because I felt there was the potential to be signatures in the geological records and in you know, academic papers that I could go away and look for evidence of this. Suddenly, I had an understanding of a whole series of synchronous events in my life going back years. Now, going all the way back to the events in around 2002 when I'd had this shamanic journey experience where I'd seen you know, an alien craft basically coming in towards the Earth and the sense that a large craft had been destroyed in space, that there were a few survivors coming down to the planet. Now, at the time, I had no, I had no framework for that experience. Suddenly, there was a book telling me that a huge spaceship had been destroyed in orbit, that beings wearing blue outfits, which is, again, I saw a being, you know, in a blue outfit. In fact, I experienced being this entity in a craft, a tall being in a 
tight blue outfit. And I'm reading about these tall beings in these tight blue outfits. I was in tears. The emotional impact was immense. And then of course, I'm understanding now why in Egypt, I'm compelled to look up at the Pleiades because they're telling us this craft has jumped through some kind of wormhole located in the Pleiades just before it arrives to Earth. This was a story that I needed to really delve into to see, you know, could this be validated? For me personally, it felt true. But I knew that for other people to see this as a story worth hearing, I needed to support it with evidence. How do we come about? You know, what are we? What is a human? You know, what is our origin? Why are we here? You know, these major questions that typically have been dealt with either by religions in a you know a theological context with you know god's mysterious workings on earth or by the academics who simply give us this story of you know abiogenesis life emerging from a, a rock pool somewhere and you know a pointless series of of chance events leading to humans with you know blind evolutionary forces at work and these are the two major narratives and i hang on a minute you know there's a lot of people out there who've sensed that Neither of these are telling us the accurate story. You know, they may have parts right, but there's something obviously not right about this story. And I, I realized that there was the opportunity here to perhaps validate this, this narrative in such a way as to, to give other people answers. And so I looked at the, the core claims within this, this transmission, let's call it, from this artifact. Now, we say this artifact to me could be seen as a Bracewell probe, for anyone who's familiar with the idea in, in SETI science that a Bracewell probe essentially is an alien artifact that could be left on a planet, could record, interact, and even make contact with people at the right moment. This artifact seems to be functioning in that way. The information it provides includes several events that I think could potentially be validated. The first being a huge craft in orbit, destroyed, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Now I'm thinking, could that leave evidence? I mean, particularly in as much as we're told it's destroyed, debris rains down onto the surface. Could that debris weather the test of time? Could there be some of it left? And that's where I really began. And I went looking through the literature thinking, would we find some signs of melted crystalline debris scattered somewhere that might fit with this claim? I half expected that to be a big no, in all honesty, you know, with hundreds of thousands of years of, of geological processes underway, what's the chances? But incredibly, it turned out that there was a 100 year long mystery in science about a material called Australite tectite, which is largely silica, is melted quartz at around 75% of the composition. So, Straight away I'm thinking, hey, you know, we've got a hit here in terms of the actual chemical makeup. The material is scattered across 20 to 30% of the Earth's surface. It's known that it has to have come down from space due to the shape that it's actually in, this button shape. I mean, NASA have investigated this and they tell us the tectite buttons can only have formed in an event out in space that involved high energy, that melted the source body, turned it into little droplets, spheres of a crystalline glass, which have then had secondary melting as they've entered the, the Earth's atmosphere. Now, Australite tectite is really unique in the history of this planet, no 4.5 billion years. You know, you, you only find this particular composition once and, and it's centered only on one location, Australia. Now, for me, of course, that was immense because here I'm reading in the account that the survivors of this event land in the southern part of Australia and where do I find this debris? Scattered across the southern part of Australia. The mystery around the Australite tectite centers on the fact that there is no crater that is the source of this, this material. Now, geologists would expect there to be an impact event that's maybe thrown this out and that, you know, this is their best guess at how the tectite formed. Now, there is no crater. You know, 
decades of research have, have shown that it, just, it does not exist. It should be in Southeast Asia, if anywhere, because there's chunks of debris at about 20 kilos in weight. The type of event we're talking about should leave a crater that's you know, many, many miles across. I mean, they're looking at an object they think would have been around a kilometer in diameter, you know, coming in at perhaps you know, 40 miles a second and, and slamming down into the planet, throwing out this mass of debris. Now, the obvious thing you look for in an event like that is the crater. Now this raises another mystery because Earth is not considered massive enough to capture asteroids or comets and have them remain in orbit. It's, it's not considered possible in the physical understanding of these objects. The speeds they're traveling at, they would either slam into the planet or they're accelerated past us by the gravity effects you know, of, the, of the Earth itself. They do not end up captured and circling in orbit. And yet NASA tell us again that this body was in orbit before it exploded. And that that's the only way to explain the shaping of these objects is that they are moving essentially horizontal to the plane of the planet in a decaying orbit and are, are gradually melted into these shapes. That they have no other explanation. So we have a very anomalous object made of around 75 to 80 percent silica that just parks itself in orbit. No other asteroids or other bodies are known to contain more than 60 percent silica. This is an entirely anomalous chemical makeup which fits very well with another claim in the Alcharinga story which is that this is a vast silica network housing a living self-aware AI. Vast silica networks are precisely what the leading edge thinkers in AI believe we will create to house a you know, self-aware intelligence, these, these AI intelligences of the future. And, and here we have the exact kind of material we'd expect for one. It's, it was an absolute total mesh with the book material, this download, and the real world science in a way that I never imagined that I would find such conclusive evidence that this was a real event. One of the second major claims in the, in the material, which was that five years after this craft is destroyed in orbit, that there is a, a second arrival to this planet by a group of extraterrestrials that are connected with the craft, that are allies, who come here on a type of revenge mission and enforcement to tackle the, the other group that have caused this, that have attacked this craft. I'm thinking, well, is it possible that an asteroid bombardment would have left some kind of signature? We think so. We know that we can detect impact events going back millions, you know, even billions of years sometimes, if they're significant enough. I mean, obviously, we have the famous case of the, the dinosaurs being eradicated by one of these major impacts. I thought, could it be that there is something out there? Now, this was a bit synchronous because as it turned out, there really, there, there was nothing in the, in terms of the academic papers, there was no um, but peer reviewed study that had gone through you know, that pointed to this. Instead, what I found was that just a couple of years before, in 2015, there had been a geological team investigating the, the signs of a multi-directional asteroid bombardment of our planet and the dates they'd come up with was 780,000 years ago. Now, if I had looked for this information just a few years ago, I would have found nothing. It wouldn't have been there. That only at this time could somebody have validated that claim. And keep in mind, the original material is from 1994. So there's no way that even at the time when it was, when it was downloaded and written about that anyone could have validated this. So years later, at just the right moment, I'm prompted to look and the, the discoveries are in process. We now know that there were impacts across America, Africa, Tasmania, um, all around the world. In fact, a major one down in Antarctica, an object the size, the same size as the one at the Chicxulub crater, which is believed to have eradicated the dinosaurs. An object on that scale impacted Antarctica 780,000 years ago, leaving a crater that is 200 miles by 200 miles. I mean, we are talking about an enormous event. 
And at the other sites, we have major impacts that have left, you know, scarring across these, each of these continents, precisely in the way this downloaded information has told us that this is many objects that bombard separately at different points on the planet. Now, how does this come about, this anomalous bombardment? This is not a natural event. And in fact, if you look at the academic studies, they don't even try to explain this. They have no explanation for this bombardment. Why are these separate asteroids all suddenly coming in from different directions at the same moment and hitting this planet? An unprecedented event. And one, of, one of the understandings that eventually came to me as I dug deeper into this was that this asteroid impact event was not unconnected to the magnetic reversal. There's, there's now a number of scientists that are positing that it was in fact the impacts that caused the geomagnetic reversal. Was it an attempt to cause a reversal? Now, I don't know that, but certainly it seems that these major impacts may well have not only caused a cataclysm in terms of tsunamis, earthquakes, firestorms, you know, a nuclear winter. These, these are all things that are hypothesized that it caused, but it now seems also induced a magnetic field reversal. Having validated that there was not only a large crystalline object in orbit, just as this information had stated, and having found that there was indeed a multi-directional asteroid bombardment, as the information had stated, I now was in a position where I had to look at perhaps the most controversial and most important claim in this information, which is of course that Homo sapiens are tied to this story. That this, these beings, this intelligence, you know, goes on to make a modification in the early hominins that are living on the planet at this time. Could this also be true? Now, I was in a fortunate position, having already written a book, The Forgotten Exodus, which tackled human evolution, the early migrations, and the story of these archaic hominins. I was aware that there were anomalies in that narrative already, and had quite a familiarity with the academic literature. So, one of the things I already knew was that in just the last few years, that story has majorly shifted that instead of positing that around 400 to 500,000 years ago, Homo sapiens begin to diverge from other hominins, it's been pushed back to around 750 to 800,000. And bang in the middle of that, of course, is 780,000 years ago. So this is quite astonishing in that, again, if it had been a few years before and this information had come to me, I would not have been able to validate this in the same way that the asteroid strike wouldn't have been able to be validated. That this is cutting edge information. Now, one of the reasons why we know that Homo sapiens begins to diverge 780,000 years ago is, is a couple of different finds. One being the Cima de los Huesos site in Spain, where we now have the oldest DNA ever recovered from a hominin species. Now, these are actually archaic ancestors of Neanderthals. And the thing is that it's told us is that the split between Neanderthals and modern humans occurred far earlier than was previously understood. And it's pushed those dates way, way back. That they were able to see that these Sima hominins were much closer to Neanderthals than expected. And in fact, that the only way to explain this depth and the divergence seen in the genome there was to push our, our own divergence from their ancestors back to around 750,000 or more years ago. Now that's not the only thing. With the Denisovan genome being fully mapped quite recently, they found that the Denisovan ancestors, they seem to begin to diverge away from those direct ancestors of modern humans somewhere in the region of 800,000 years ago. Again, bolstering this date. And I could go through various other studies. There's, there are some older research papers which suggested that some specific, um, specific genes and specific proteins in the past have already pointed to, to a divergence event around 700 to 800,000 years ago. So this isn't entirely new. We also know that in the fossil record, there is an anomalous event occurring just after 800,000 years ago with the human brain suddenly going into overdrive, that we have this massive expansion in the cranial capacity, which has long been known 
due to the fossil finds, but nobody could explain it. Of course, now we have the genetic data coming in saying that, hey, there's some changes underway at the genomic level, which go towards explaining this sudden, unprecedented and anomalous brain size expansion in our ancestors. As I sort of drilled down into this genetics part of the story, I was really astonished to find that there were some studies that hugely pointed to anomalous events at the beginning of our Homo sapiens story. Now, one of these is the fusion of chromosome two, which is usually obviously assumed to be a natural event. But when you look at that, and I've had a, a biologist friend of mine look closely at this and say that, well, there's, there's not really strong support for the idea that it's natural. That's assumed because nobody's going to go there with the idea that it could be unnatural. That in fact, there's a lot of anomalies to do with the way that this is, not only the way that it's happened in the genome, but the fact that it goes on to be present in every living human, that rather than having a, a singular strange mutation that fades away, it becomes completely universal to our species. There's a total replacement of all of the 48 chromosome humans with those with 46. It's also inferred that this fusion must have brought incredible benefits for those who had it. This is part of the explanation for why it became so widespread. Also, that it had to happen in a small, isolated population for it to become persistent. Now, that's precisely meshes with a test group. A small, isolated population suddenly has these miraculous, beneficial changes that are, are so beneficial they persist working against the forces of evolution, which usually remove these kind of fusion events because they're normally usually negative. And instead, we see this really strange replacement of all humans. This also fits with what's known as CRISPR gene drives. Now, if anyone's familiar with gene drives, I know that this, this is a cutting edge technology where we've realized that you can, you can change the way in which information is, is inherited and have different groups mixing but yet the traits you want them to have will be passed on to everyone. Instead of having the information from two parents, only one parent's information is passed on. And you overwrite a species. Now this is a technology that can literally make species extinct or completely replace the existing group. Now that's exactly what we see happen at the early stages of Homo sapiens, which is itself a red flag. But it's not this alone. It's not just chromosome two. We find that there are a slew of changes that have been titled human accelerated regions. These human accelerated regions are in fact, by definition, areas of the code that have gone through rapid evolution, accelerated evolution. What is the explanation for this? In fact, we find there isn't one. That the academics that have discovered this say that having crunched the numbers, they believe that there is around about a 0% chance of the changes they're seeing having happened by any understood evolutionary mechanisms. Now, what do these areas do? Crucially, they happen to be in areas of non-coding DNA known as essentially switches that control the expression of genes, whether to turn them on or off, to make them express stronger, or to express less, and if you know how to change those areas of code, you can completely redesign an organism. And that's where they're finding these anomalies, hundreds of them. Most of them are to do with brain development. Now that circles back around to those anomalous changes we see in the fossil record, where the human brain goes through this bizarre acceleration in not only size, but structure and complexity, right at that point just after 800,000 years ago. And now we find there are hundreds of anomalies in non-coding DNA that would really explain a lot of what we're seeing and that the academics are telling us we've got nothing when it comes to an explanation. I, I even went to the, the leading person in that field and a question was put to them about my work and she said, well, I don't think it's connected to aliens and gave, gave her understanding of what it was. And in fact, her argument has already been dismissed. I found a more recent paper on the subject, we said that no, 
her, her understanding of it is wrong and there is no explanation to this day. And this is a, a 2017 paper which says that you know, no, nothing has come up yet that explains these changes. And that's the most recent paper on the topic. So these are completely unexplained other than by an intelligence at work modifying the genome. And these are the signatures of that process. For me, one of the fascinating elements of the timing of this contact with this intelligence and what seems to be a cosmic nudge to look at this information is that we have to consider that it's only now that we really understand genetic engineering, that we are on the cusp of a major revolution in that field with these CRISPR technologies and gene drives. And, and essentially, we may well be at the end of Homo sapiens, with the beginning of something like a Homo sapiens 2.0 where we can now change humans at the genomic level you know, and start to incorporate technologies from you know, nanotechnologies, cybernetics, you know, all of these things are, are, are happening now. And yet we are being sort of nudged to look at a story that is telling us, hey, all of these things have happened before and will happen again. That you know, it's, the cycle is almost completing. And that we're, again, we're also seeing a lot of talk about looking for asteroid threats and bombardments that subject is big right now and of course the fact that we just now can really appreciate the science behind these revelations is, is quite extraordinary that we're being nudged to look at it you know is that deliberate that's why we need to know hey this is how it happened in the first place that we now have those capabilities. We have the, the fire of the gods passed down to us. One of the surprises for me in the, in the narrative of this information is that we can see that assuming that you know this is sufficient validation for people to say that there's an intelligence at work, what does it tell us about this intelligence and advanced entities that are out there in space? Well one of the things it points to is that it's not necessarily the case that by becoming hugely advanced that you are totally peaceful and, and no longer have to worry about any problems. We sometimes feel that, you know, in a Star Trek future, all ideas of conflict and um, competition may be removed. And yet here we're seeing entities that can move around through wormholes, that they can modify species, they can do all this, but yet they still come into conflicts. They still have weapon systems. They still have to think about fight, flight, flee. And not as far removed in those basic levels as we might have expected, as many new age thinkers would theorize that there is only peace out there. Is it okay to play God? Should we be going into the genome and modifying species? Should they have done it? What might we expect of cosmic intelligences? And is it anything like the ideas that most people have got in their heads. <laughs>